my name is Maria Parajeles. I work at the Power Systems Laboratory. And yeah, we're going to hold, as Lea introduced already, this presentation together with Federica and Giovann. Let's start first with the motivation. I'll say a few words on the overarching motivation uh, of, of the three of our works. So we all know that the electrification of transport um, requires, of course, the study of its integration within the electricity sector. Thankfully, though, this um, transfer demand is especially flexible due to lots and lots of parking time, which then allows for exploring smart ways to manage that load for an efficient integration into, into the electricity um, sector. Uh, to study this integration, we require different models of the demand and flexibility that are actually representative of the population and the geographical location under study which is why uh, we will first explore a modeling approach that does not require charging data availability uh, and does not encounter this representativeness problems. Um, when charging data is available though, we also show our exploration on data-driven modeling approaches that help us then quantify and predict the demand and flexibility and ultimately then validate uh, some of our models. Lastly, we want to show our work on how to move from not just quantifying, but actually accessing the flexible resources in the transfer demand through different studies of policies and regulations uh, possible. So in summary, uh, we will discuss our work towards modeling, validating, and accessing charging demand and flexibility from the transport sector. So I'll continue talking for now. So I'll start first with my work and give you a bit of an um, overview of the mobility-based um, modeling framework with, we're working with. So first, I want to lay the basis of the modeling framework we used based on mobility information in Switzerland. So we use the result of an agent-based transport simulation, which describes the number of mobile vehicles in a day, and particularly their traveling patterns. So this information is georeferenced and allows us to characterize the type of parking location of vehicles. You can see that here on, on the left um, with the distribution of location through, through the day. And ultimately this information allows us to represent the potential charging events also in these locations. We then apply uh, to this data set, a detailed traction, heating, and cooling driving energy estimation model. Um, this allows us to describe the charging energy needs uh, for a potential electrified fleet across uh, the territory of Switzerland, as you can see in this um, heat map here on the top right. Um, and we apply that under four different weather conditions to describe, for example, different periods of, of the year. And you can see the comparison here in the, in the bar plot. Uh, ultimately, we also extend the model to a week-long mobility and energy needs patterns using op uh, open statistical data. So now, based on the described georeferenced energy model, um, we take a step further to actually model the charging decisions of users. And these will then help us build what we end up calling a base case charging profile, meaning we try to model the unshifted and, and purely energy needs based charging uh, behavior. So for that, we consider a widely available charging infrastructure. Um, the charging rate of this infrastructure depends on the location um, of the parking and it ranges from 7 to 22 kilowatts uh, in, in charging speed. The charging decision model itself is actually based on the battery's state of charge. So we use a probabilistic model that's based on a distribution um, of positive plug-in decisions as a function of the state of charge of the battery. Um, this information we take from a compilation of four different EV trial studies that just collected uh, information on where um, or what was the state of charge of, of users when they decided to, to actually plug in and charge their vehicles. Um, we also, for this, enforced a couple of heuristics in the model, 
And this, what helps us is to get closer to a rational plugging decision. So for example, we ensure a minimum state of charge at all times, and also the planning of some users for a future trips to be actually uh, realizable. Um, then we also are interested in extending this information, not just from one week charging profiles, but actually creating a whole one year uh, long charging profile. So for that, we assign different weather periods, weeks to a specific months, and then repeat those weeks accordingly. Um, also, we are able to vary what decade in the future we're modeling. And we do that by applying different electrification rates that thankfully we have on a municipality resolution um, based on a study recently published from the University of, of Geneva. Then taking those base case charging profiles as a reference, we calculate the flexibility that is available in every moment of time and also in every location by following the, the formulation we will go through in this, in this slide. So, oh, sorry. We consider actually only the so-called uh, idle time flexibility by taking as sources of available flexibility only the parking events where the driver had already decided to plug in and, and charge. We also avoid quantifying unrealistic flexibility from charging events that are, for example, too short or that are too long uh, or where the parking, all the parking time is needed to reach the desired uh, state of charge of the battery. We also try to maximize the driver's comfort by considering that the same final state of charge should be reached uh, independently of whether the charging event was considered flexible uh, or not. And also importantly, as you can see in these plots here on the, on the left below, um, we distinguish between cases where there is full freedom on when the charging event can take place. So that would be the first one uh, on the left. And thus all the energy charge is also considered flexible or when the flexibility can be offered only during part of the charging event. That would be the second plot in, in the middle. Uh, and thus the, the actual flexible energy is also limited. So at the end, this formulation, what allows us is to obtain a plot like the one here on the bottom right, where we estimate uh, the, both the upper and the bottom um, flexibility bounds for the base case charging profiles for each hour of the day and also for each location. Uh, with this, we can also, of course, calculate the flexible energy that um, or the percentage of flexible energy of the total charge energy in, in, in these um, charging profiles. So now we can look a bit on how the results look. So this is for a whole national fleet um, electrified and, and considered potentially flexible. So as you can see, we found non-symmetrical bounds here on the, on the plots that are drawn in blue and in and in gray. And these are non-symmetrical, as you can see, with a graded upward power flexibility, because we notice that the shorter charging times are the most common, actually, in the, in the modeling. We also estimate an average of 1.2 gigawatts of overhead uh, flexibility, with a maximum peak that can be even double that in some hours of the day. The downwards flexibility is on average around 500 megawatts with a value of around 1.2 gigawatts, which is, of course, still more than significant in operation when trying, for example, to reduce peaks across the loads. Um, we also notice that across the year, we, we obtain a difference in charging peak of around 16%. This due to the difference between colder and warmer days uh, needs for charging. Um, and then lastly, something that is also relevant is that we find an important difference in flexible energy during the week and the weekends. So as you can see in the comparison here in the bar plot, around 60% of energy flexibility is found on the weekdays and about half of that on the weekends, showcasing, for example, um, 
how the model captures less mobility on these days with loss with uh, less long charging uh, events available that result from, for example, reduced work parking and, and more extended periods at home uh, for parking too. Then taking a deep dive into more localized results, we see in these slides the capability of the modeling framework uh, to capture these geographic differences, both in the charging and in the flexibility um, based on, on, on its geographic location and its level of urbanization. So we see also here on the right, the comparison of three aggregated zone, zones that are comprised mostly of uh, urban, peri-urban or rural areas where in the urban areas, we see a higher presence of public charging with shorter events and little flexibility then resulting from that, as opposed to, for example, rural areas where charging occurs mostly at home, and then naturally we get longer parking events and more flexibility as well. Then to start concluding this part of the presentation, I, I want to mention how we're planning to use this whole modeling framework and all the data that we've been generating to evaluate its effects across the, the scales of the power system. So here on the left, um, starting from the top one now, uh, we have integrated all this modeling already into the pipeline of Nexus E, where we are now ready to run simulations on the transmission level side, um, using this specific or this time and location specific flexibility that we have generated. Then in the coming months, the step forward we want to take is to extend this capability um, by including this modeling framework as a standalone module in, in Nexus E. And with that, what we're looking for is to just be able to have input assumptions being modified um, and then having this charging profile and the flexibility also interacting with the investment and the dispatch decisions that are made at distribution grid level as well. Um, yeah, so I think with that, I actually give the floor to Federica, who will continue then with, with the details on, on her work. So I will take over from here to show you how we can use real charging data to validate the models Maria just mentioned and fully exploit the available flexibility from the mobility sector. So we performed two analyses, one in the Netherlands and one in the Switzerland using the real charging data. And we use this data to validate what Maria just said and also to see how we can quantify and predict the available flexibility. So let's start from the beginning as, uh, as you just seen like uh, from the modeling when you uh, like, uh, like when we, you deal with mobility based models, you assume some assumption about the charging and the human behavior. Uh, and these assumptions are quite challenging as uh, they should come from real charging data, but the EV mobility data are often like privately owned and they are not publicly available. And they're usually owned by single operators, such as charge point operators. So it's not easy to validate this assumption. At the same time, even when, that, when these data are available for the single operator, exploiting the flexibility remains a big challenge as managing the single charging sessions require information on future human behaviors. So what we did was, as I said, conduct an analysis from EV charging data in Netherlands and in Switzerland to investigate how to quantify and predict the available flexibility in a real world scenario. So we start from the analysis in Netherlands. We collaborate with one of the largest charge point operator in Netherlands that is Total Energies, and they made us available a large data set of 10,000 public charge points with over 2.5 million charging session over a year. And the first step was to mathematically formulate the definition of flexibility that you can now see here. And this is the product between the energy demand and the uh, time in which the EV is plugged in, but it's actually not charging. So this means, according to this definition, in order to quantify the flexibility, it means that the single operator, as soon as the EV is plugged in, will need to know how much time, how much, uh, how long is the session duration and how much energy the EV will require at the end of the session. So we need to predict these two parameters, and that's why we explore data-driven approaches for such a prediction. 
And these two data-driven approaches are mainly looking at the charge point uh, uh, perspective and the user perspective, perspective. And the idea here is that if we include more information about the uh, user historical behavior, potentially the prediction will be enhanced. Uh, so looking into the machine learning approaches we use, so we focus first on the charge points. So we look at historical data from charge points and we uh, identify four main classes based on the uh, starting hour of the duration and the, of the session and the duration of the session. So the four classes are like a home, session, home charge points where the session is usually starting in the evening and usually uh, lasting for like quite a long time. And then there is the work charger points where uh, charge points where the session is starting in the morning and it's usually lasting for around eight, 10 hours. And then there is short say uh, uh, charge points where the session duration is over the day and it's usually a few hours. And then the last class is the hybrid charge points that is just like different. Um, it could be used for work or for home or for short stay, stay session. And then for each of these cluster from the data set, we uh, train an XGBoost model, and I will show you which training features we use. Now, looking at the second approach is the user perspective approach. So in here, the problem was that from the available data, we don't have the uh, time series data for each single user. And the reason is mainly because a single user can potentially charge a different operator. So what we did was to start from the uh, charging data of frequent users at the same operator. So from the, the data uh, total energies provided us and try to uh, fit a tri-model distribution. And then from this distribution by sample, like one, uh, for example, for a specific EV user, which has like a session in the morning, some service session in the afternoon, and then coming back in the home or in the evening, we can sample like three hours per day in the morning, afternoon, and evening, and then get the expected like a duration uh, from this distribution. And that's how we got like time series data to test our user um, perspective approach. Now, looking at the data we use, so we have several features. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, for example, there are features related to the to the charger itself, for example, the maximum power or the average energy demand and duration. Then we have like the session related features, for example, when the session is happening, or like the day, the year or the month. And then we also use local information. So the weather, the, the weather conditions, and also user specific uh, uh, features such as the user moving uh, uh, average, the maximum and minimum. And what we need to predict, as I said at the beginning, is the energy demand of the session and the duration of the session. Now, looking at some results, this is for the Netherlands, as I said, we first start from the charge point cluster based approach. And what you can see here, so on the, the, the cluster is like we, 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 we classify the input data set into 10 clusters, each of them can be hybrid or short stay or home. And what we got at the end that is more relevant, the most relevant information here is that the, um, the prediction for the hour it's around three hours. And this is not a good result from a charge point perspective because on a single session, three hours of uh, error, it's quite big, well, quite large. So you cannot risk that you sh uh, were to shift the, like, the, the charging and at the end of the session, the V is not charged. However, what is useful in from this analysis was that by um, aggregating all the flexibility, the aggregated flexibility from the charge points was quite accurate. This is not relevant for the charge point operator, but could be very relevant information for a grid operator in that case. On the other side, then we say, okay, now let's let's test if by considering the user specific behavior, the accuracy can be improved. So we took like a fleet of 10 EVs by sampling the historical data, as I said before. And in this case, the hour was 2.6, the error was 2.6 hour. There is a 21% improvement. Uh, it depends on, on the single <laughs> like uh, use case, if it's acceptable or not. Uh, and then, uh, this is the analysis for for the Netherlands, and then starting from this um, from this uh, uh, 
probability distribution of the different charge points. We compare them to what is available from the EV trial study that Maria was mentioning, and they are actually very similar. So with the next step was to see if we can get similar uh, analysis in, the, in Switzerland. So we collaborate with our cooperation partner, Energy360, and uh, we started like a, a new analysis in Switzerland. In this case, we also had like a very large data set. So we have around 10,000 chargers with more than 1 million sessions between 2022 and 2024. And we decided in this case to focus mainly on AC charging. So that's why we limit our analysis to 22 kilowatt hour max power, maximum power. Uh, and on the right, you can see uh, the, the analysis, so, so how the data set look like. So uh, most of the charger are 11 kilowatt hour, 22 kilowatt hour, and we have more private charging than public charging. And then we we did the same analysis. So try to predict like the, the two parameters for the flexibility predictions that are energy demand and duration. In this case, the error for the energy demand was uh, around 10 kilowatt hour and the duration was 2.9 hour. Uh, and in these plots, I'm just showing you the difference between the actual flexibility and the predicted one. And what's the highlight from, the, from this analysis that our prediction is very conservative. So you can see it's always underestimating the available flexibility. And this is quite important because uh, in daily operation, it's better to underestimate than overestimate. And then I'm just showing you the results for different days, for private and public, and for different months. And discussing with Maria, we use some of this, uh, um, this, uh, this analysis for her assumption on the state of charge, or so how much the user is, uh, how frequently the user is charging or not. And then uh, we also look at different like uh, area. So as I suspected, and as Maria also said, uh, the higher flexibility is coming from the Zurich region area. So you can see it's the number eight. And the last analysis we did was to look at the available flexibility over time, instead of just aggregating it according to the different area or the different days. So in here, we selected just the postal code for the Zurich city. So between 8,000 and 8,099. Uh, if I'm not wrong. And in that case, you can see from this plot, what you have is that at each hour, how much flexibility is available. And this is an information that the, the operator can, can, can use. Again, in this case, the, the, the prediction is conservative against the actual value. And this is uh, something uh, useful for the operation itself. Um, yeah, and then this is all from my side. So now Siobhan will take over. Thank you, Federica and Maria. It's super interesting. I'm going to take us sort of to a smaller scale now instead of large scale flexibility predictions. Um, and this paper is available as a preprint. It's now under review. It's led by my former student, Daniel. And basically, it's great that we have all of this flexibility. <laughs> Um, and Maria and Federica have done all this work to quantify it, but just having that flexibility and knowing that it's there isn't really enough. We need to use it somehow. And accessing that flexibility depends on all sorts of things like regulations, policies, tariffs, how much it costs. You know, maybe the flexibility is there, but if each user can only make one franc per year from participating, maybe they're not interested. In this paper, we look particularly at B2G. So B1G is unidirectional charging, where energy is always flowing from the grid to the vehicle. And B2G, you can also send energy back, so a little more flexibility. And B2, B1G is likely profitable, but there's actually quite a lot of questions around the techno-economics of B2G. So one of the factors is high station costs. Uh, if you bought a new B2G-capable station in Switzerland today, it would cost about 11,000 francs compared to a few thousand for a V1G station. There's also this question of double taxation, which basically means that energy that's used for V2G and then discharged back to the grid is taxed twice along the way. So when it's first drawn, like if it were a battery, it's drawn to the vehicle and then it's, you pay tax on it at that time, and then it's discharged back to the grid. 
typically not reimbursed for that tax. And then later when that same energy is used somewhere else, it's also taxed again. Um, and this creates quite a barrier for V2G operators. There's been a lot of discussion about how to deal with this and whether this should change. And that's something that we look at in this paper. Um, you think about flexibility markets, like offering flexibility services, frequency regulation, all of this typically comes with a minimum bid size that's a little prohibitive. So in this paper, we also look at just responding to tariffs, not participating in big flexibility markets. And of course, there are other non-technical barriers like social acceptance. People worry a lot about battery degradation, although there's not a lot of evidence that there's really a problem with that for V2G. It sort of looms very large in the mind. So all of these barriers are things that we wanted to look into. So in this paper, we do a techno-economic analysis of a case in Switzerland to see if B2G is profitable and how policymakers or regulators could make it profitable to help see wider deployment. Um, we don't assess in this paper whether we need wider deployment of B2G. That's a separate research question. Here, we just look at this very small scale question of how you could get it. I won't go into the modeling a lot, focus mostly on the results, but these are basically the important inputs. So we consider a workplace aggregator that has 50 vehicles with 25 chargers. Um, people arrive from home where they had access to charging, so they typically arrive pretty with a pretty high state of charge. We use an agent-based model of their driving and charging patterns to get the sort of constraints on the aggregators optimization, like what state of charge they arrive with, how much energy they need. We use the census data from uh, the MZMV, the micro census of mobility and transport. Um, and we assume that the aggregator has all these vehicles arriving. It can change how they're charging to minimize its costs, but it must deliver the same total energy. So they all leave with the same state of charge and no one is the worse for this. And these on, on the left, these are the two main tariffs that we consider. So we use an existing tariff that is the blue one here. So this is the per kilowatt hour cost as you go through different times of day. And you see it has high price periods around noon and in the early evening. And this tariff was designed basically to reduce peak in the system. And then we consider a new tariff that's called the PV tariff for this reason, you can see we put a low price period during the day when PV generation is high. Um, we set the levels of the tariff in this base case so that on average, someone who's not doing control would end up paying the same amount in each of these cases, but the timing is different. And you can see what this does in a very simple case to this workplace parking lot. The black is the uncontrolled profile, so you can see it's high, people actually arrive at work very early in the Swiss travel data. So there's a peak a little before 8 a.m. Uh, there's a little bit more charging as people come back after lunch, but this is a pretty small profile. And then the red and blue are what happens when we let the aggregator control the charging. And you can see there's a lot more going on. So in the PV tariff case, the aggregator discharges as much as possible before the start of the low price period and then yes they discharge before and then they charge as much as possible when prices are low and the peak tariff does sort of the opposite so it charges as long as the price isn't high and then it discharges to take advantage of that peak period over lunch and then it charges and makes up for it afterwards so big swings in price uh, demand profile changes this doesn't always happen. So one of our first results was looking at the conditions where you see all of this discharging. And it may seem obvious now looking back, but we found that you have to have a fairly high discharging price to make this worthwhile. So here, this is the minimum charging price and the maximum discharging price. This price difference has to at least overcome round trip losses of charging and discharging. We looked at a few different cases because these are all under discussion in Switzerland right now. Basically, as the network charge changes, there's some question around how much it should be reimbursed for discharging. And if you choose a small value or a high value, also if you reimburse taxes or not, 
these are changing and it affects whether there's any discharging. So to make this a little more concrete, these are prices for charging the dashed line. You can see it's the same across all these cases. And then a few different cases for discharging prices. In the first case, the discharging is only paid back for energy costs and for the minimum network charge, but it's not reimbursed taxes, for example. And you can see the highest discharging price maybe only barely passes the lowest charging price. If you add taxes, so the discharging price also includes taxes, then you actually get a higher discharging price here. So maybe it's worth it to charge in this low price period and then discharge here. If you discharge with a different network charge reimbursement, the difference is bigger. And when we look at the profiles, we see this reflected very clearly. So in the first case, it's not paid enough for discharging to make it worthwhile. And so in the optimization, we actually see no discharging at all. The optimization says this isn't worth it. I have these round trip losses, nothing happens. And then once you pass some threshold, we see the sort of maxing out of how much discharging there can be. So next we looked at how this affects the sort of lifetime costs of the operator. We don't assume any way that they're reimbursed. So you wanna compare this against the uncontrolled charging case over here. And you can see that V1G, for example, reduced these variable costs a little bit, saves a little bit of money. So there's this little gap that forms here, but it's not actually that much better. Um, and for the other cases, we didn't wanna assume how much the charging station would cost because V to G stations, the prices are changing a lot. So this green bar is the maximum possible charging station costs for it to even out. So the best case over here, the discharging is reimbursed really highly, taxes are reimbursed. You see there's a lot of revenue from a lot of discharging variable costs. It's more than makes up for it. And so you could have a charging station that costs about 8,000 francs and it would still break even. It would be worth it to do V2G compared to having uncontrolled charging. But uh, over here, if you don't get taxes reimbursed with discharging, then you can only have a station that costs about 6,000 for it to be worth it. And these other cases, you even have negative station costs. So you're losing money by doing V2G, even if the station were totally free. We also did this case for the PV tariff, but the results are basically the same story. And if we dig into these costs a little bit more, you can see the effect of some of these regulation choices. So this dark blue bar here is what the aggregator is paid back in taxes when it discharges. If you take that away, you assume that they don't get reimbursed for taxes on discharging, you directly lose that amount from the sort of maximum station costs or from what their profit would be. And finally, to end the story, comparing these different tariffs, what do they mean for the system? This is another question outside of the paper, but we used some of the data from FCC to look at what these tariffs would do at a system level. And so the existing tariff we found is better at controlling peaks. So it can help decrease peak net demand by avoiding adding demand at times of peak demand for the grid compared with the PV tariff, which doesn't have a big impact and can actually increase the peak in the early period whereas the PV tariff can reduce curtailment a lot by aligning with solar later in the period when there's a lot of solar generation. All in all, <laughs> there's a lot of questions, I think. All of these different policy tools you could turn, you could remove taxes, you could reimburse taxes, you could subsidize stations, you could choose not to subsidize stations. You can, we also looked at changing the spread of the prices between low and high periods, you can change the timing of the different time of use rates. These are all different things that we looked at in the paper, but I think the takeaway is it depends what you want for the system, what the best tariff would be and what these regulations should be. So in conclusion, summarizing across all three of our presentations, one of the first conclusions was that charging and flexibility vary across space and time. So by time of year, across Switzerland, Tracking this is really important to help identify region and time-specific complementarities or mismatches. And including this representation is crucial in planning for future charging infrastructure and flexibility. Second, looking at data-driven approaches, 
you can develop a conservative flexibility prediction compared to actual quantification. Um, this method accounting for user-specific behaviors enhances the accuracy of flexibility predictions. And in the Switzerland case, by far the highest flexibility was observed in the Zurich region. And finally, the techno-economics of implementing this may be challenging. And depending on the tariff design, depending on the case, station subsidies might be needed until prices fall. And to incentivize V2G, this double taxation is a real barrier in current tariffs and regulations. Uh, some acknowledgements for our work, and then we will open the floor to questions.